actual history, it'll lead you to the truth, of course. But we can see what it's pertaining to. So again, you have them taking real history, distorting it, changing it, but leaving enough in there for you to figure out exactly who was talking to. And that's for the Masons. That's for the Masons. The Masons understand, you know, they can go in the book and understand, you know, what it's talking to, who it's pertaining to. That's for the historian as well. Because if you're a historian, you know, well, wait a minute, damn, this, this can't be, this is Alexander's story. It's clear as day. But you heard people before say, you know, Alexander uh, is in, you know, the Bible or what have you. Yeah, he's in there, but it's not talking about him in name specifically. But we can understand it's alluding to him to get people to break it down to understand what it's really talking about. So now remember in the Saturn of Satan series, we talked about Alexander. We talked about their whole story. And, you know, we're going to get into that in a second. But remember, Tyre was basically being destroyed because the man proclaimed to be a god. So when you go to Ezekiel 28, as we talked about before, it is talking about the story of Satan. Remember, it's basically trying to couple Satan with this man. It's trying to give you this comparison. So he's addressing the king of Tyre while he's talking about Satan. It's giving you this comparison in Ezekiel as well as in Isaiah. Remember, it said a man specifically. So remember, go back to the story of Alexander. We talked about how, you know, he is the only person, one, who fits this story. He is the only person you can look to that actually proclaimed to be a God who was a man that we know existed. So remember in the story of Alexander, you had his mom. Alexander one proclaiming to be a God because his mom was basically seduced by Jupiter, which Jupiter would be the Roman equivalent of the Greek Zeus. So remember the depiction when you had uh, Olympias in the bed and Zeus on top of her with like the serpent lower half. And this is basically where, you know, he basically seduced Olympias and Alexander was born. And remember, Olympias tells Alexander on his way out to, to battle that, um, you know, he basically is the son of a god. And he was walking around proclaiming to be the son of a God. So it's giving you that story so we can match that one with a man proclaiming to be the son of a God, one, with the story of Tyre and understand all of this is talking about the same thing in this in this passage. It's talking about Alexander. It's trying to give you the coupling. Not just that, you have the serpent aspect. You have the reptilian aspect of it. You have Zeus being coupled with the serpent, the reptilian, and this whole union going on is trying to tell you something. So when you put the story together, when you look at the entire story, one, it's not only giving you Alexander, it's trying to tell you who is responsible for basically beginning the rise of the European powers. It's pointing you straight to Alexander. So when you go back and look at the story, it's telling you one, who Satan is, because this is when people tell you, hey, these Europeans proclaim or uh, described as Satan in the Bible. This is what it's talking about. You have Tyre giving us Europa, giving us Europe, giving us the Europeans, giving us all of these things right here in this area, which this area just so happens to be where, you know, they basically laid claim, started the, the rise of the power, the European power, which right here. This is where Europe derives from, this is where the people begin or uh, they attest to the rise of their power right here. So at the same time, one, as again, I said, Satan has many aspects. This is one of his aspects. One of his aspects is black, is white as well. And it all goes into the whole duality thing. You know, it don't just go to uh, to white people, go to black people as well. But these people represent the negative part of Satan. So they put in all this stuff here to make you note something. So again, you know, Dr. Ben, John Henry Clark, you know, they talked about Alexander the Greek all the time. Alexander the Greek, Alexander the Greek. And that's something that always stuck with me. Remember, I, I said before, when I first went to Kenya, when I was in the military, when I came back, like, you know, I was lost. Now, the woman did tell me in the uh, Cairo Museum, first time I went there, that I should know about Dr. Ben. You know, Dr. Ben, he get his books, whatever, you know. And luckily, I was able to get his books, and I started reading about Dr. Ben. Dr. Ben always talked about the Greeks, and he didn't really get into it, uh, you know, this way, as, as deep as this. But it was so much history that he gave about the Greeks. That's true history. Now, Dr. Ben will tell you, you're supposed to be reading your Bible. 
So I guess you figure one, if you read in your book, it's no way you're going to miss this. A lot of times we just expect people to know the Bible when people don't know it. I'll be seriously, the way these Christians be coming at me, I'll be seriously expecting them to be experts. So when I'm saying stuff and pertaining to book, chapter, and verses, they be clueless, huh? And then I just get out the conversation. I'm like, oh, no, you just emotional. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. But Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark stay on Alexander the Greek for a long time to try to get people to trace him because there's so much history that pursues this man when you start following him. You get the whole breakdown, as I just pointed out. And it gets a lot more deeper. You start to, you know, peel away a lot of the layers. And we can see the rise of this European power and see that proceeding all of this, we get Judaism, we get the Torah, or the Septuagint, what have you, and we get the beginning of the religion being established. And as I talked about before, these people who they basically forced Judaism on was the slaves, was the leftover black people in those lands. So you got to ask yourself, one, you know, how did Judaism start? Remember, I just talked about how Alexander and them basically enslaved all these people while they was there. They killed a lot of them, but enslaved a lot of the Africans, the, the Egyptians that was there. Again, the Egyptians was the first Jews. It's just that simple. These are the people they indoctrinated into the whole ideology because they tried to force Hellenization and the Greek customs on them. But you can't do that to no damn Egyptians because they know. Remember, it was the double cross. So when the Bible's talking about sinning Nebuchadnezzar in there to basically uh, you know, kill off Tyre, it's kind of the same thing that happened. Remember I said before that Alexander and them, I believe, sent the Persians in there. Because they couldn't just go in there themselves. There was a double cross on the Persians as well. Remember, the Egyptians and the Greeks was living hand in hand. Romans as well, at, at, for a time. They was living together. Peace, harmony. The Egyptians helped them build so many of the, you know, the things that's in Greece. The Egyptians didn't deal with other people, gods, or what have you, and stuff like that. But they were respectful of other people's things and understood that, you know, Greek mythology is basically Egyptian mythology. And they had their own little spin on it. They understood because they taught them how to do the shit. So they lived together peacefully. Everything was cool. So you can't have the Greek government basically say we're going to turn on these people because the people wouldn't be for it. The people was cool with the Egyptians, probably likely in a marry in some cases with some of the people. Everything was fine. So what do you do? You give the Persians the key to the back door and say, go in there and take that shit, knowing that you can beat the Persians later on, knowing the weakness, knowing if they get it to certain points, you know how to get in there. But if the Persians take over, then you can say, oh, well, we're going in there and basically helping out our, our brothers, the Egyptians. Remember, they only came to help the Egyptians one time. And I forget that story on one part of the land, but they was defeated. Uh, some of the, the Greeks came to help the Egyptians out in some part of, I believe it was near Ionia somewhere, but they was defeated and they fled. But the Greeks didn't come in full force to the aid of the Egyptians. Nobody did because people wanted to see them fail. You know, it's like being cool with somebody, with, a, with somebody who owned a mansion on the block, the biggest, best house on the block. They still looking out for y'all, but it's so much more in their house. And eventually people get together and say, you know, I can't wait till that house fall. As soon as it falls, I'm going to run in there and get what I can get. People not being grateful, people who have a material mindset, not thinking about, you know, the spiritual aspect of what the Egyptians was trying to do for them. But you had the, um, you had the Greeks basically it fall to the Romans eventually. But before all that, you had the Greeks basically, you know, enslave these black people. They created Judaism and they pushed it on the people and got them to basically indoctrinate their own people with Judaism. And they eventually spread it over to, at the time, you know, went by and they got people on board. They spread the religion because again, you know, the whole thing with LXX, the letters of Orestes, goes against the actual history of the Greeks. There's no way that Ptolemy II of Philadelphia actually, you know, paid the, the Jews all this money to come and do this translation and freed a bunch of the Jewish slaves. It don't fit. It don't make sense. Why? Because of Hellenization. 
we understand that Hellenization was going on for a long time. That Hellenization was them afflicting the Serapis, which I showed you in the video when I went to uh to the Cairo Museum. Serapis, the actual statue, them you know forcing Serapis and forcing these Greek gods on the people. This is what it was. They was forcing the um the uh the Greek ideology or what have you, trying to force it on the people. So. One of the things we have to understand, one, is if the Jews was just this separate people, separate, you know, away from the Greeks, why would the Greeks be trying to push Hellenization on them, knowing that once you set these people free, they got their own religion or what have you, and you're trying to push Hellenization? Because they did push it in Israel, but again, the people weren't going for that shit. They wasn't going for no Hellenization. They knew what it was. So they came up with Judaism. They came up with it. They, they trying to make it like, oh, well, this happened between us and the Jews so they can establish a faulty timeline by saying that Judaism was already established before this. Bullshit. It didn't happen until after that. So when y'all was trying to push, which is recorded, when I was trying to push Hellenization in that area, there was no Judaism yet. Y'all was still developing it, working on it. And then since the people didn't fall for the shit and fall for Serapis and fall for all they bullshit, they came out with Judaism, pushed it. You know, you have uh, uh, generational knowledge is what happened. So that generation passed. And remember, these people don't care about time. So they can be working towards one agenda and die trying to fulfill that agenda. But once the time passed and the kids now got indoctrinated into it, and they just grew up with Judaism and grew up with it, and it just became, it stuck. Because all the people who knew the truth was dead and gone. And then you had people with no knowledge, wasn't passed down, and they got born into this whole Judaism and it just spread. And this is how they basically spread Judaism. So you have Ezekiel giving us this story, coupling, you know, Satan with this man, with the so-called King of Tyre or what have you. So again, you look at this story again, and as, as I started out with, and you will ask yourself, well, why isn't the story about Satan in the beginning of the book. Why is it not in Genesis? That gets you thinking about Genesis. So you go to Genesis and you think about one, the story is talking about a person pretending to be a God or acting like a God. Remember, it's not 100% definitively, definitively clear on what's going on here. It's the dude possessed by Satan. It's, what, it's what, one of the most debated books in the Bible. Again, we're going to get into that, all this stuff and more when we get into the whole series on the Bible, which is going to be coming up soon. But it's debated because you got to really think about it. Why? Okay, well, give me the story. Give me the story. What's going on? What happened? Because if this was actual history and stuff that, that happened, you can give us a, a biblical account of what really happened up in heaven. Why did Satan rebel? What was going on? We know it talks about what it talks about, but go into detail the way you do with, build, with the building of Noah's Ark as far as what the hell happened up there, you know, what happened, but it doesn't really give us that. Instead, we get this, we get what's in Ezekiel, we get what's in Isaiah, we get distorted stuff in Revelations. It's not definitively clear and a couple in Satan with a man and kind of confusing you as to what's going on here. So when you go back to Genesis and it's talking about, you know, Adam and Eve and the serpent story, what have you, and you have to look at it and say, well, damn, it's almost the same as in Ezekiel. Because understand what whatever created us, whatever it was, it's not God. That's what we think of God. Whatever created us is not the same being that created the universe, all the other planets, the stars, or what have you. Plain and simple, it is not. So when you read in Genesis 1, 26, when it says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, what is it talking about? Again, this goes back to consciousness. It goes back to consciousness. It goes back to consciousness and existence itself. So making man in our likeness, you know, there is no visible image of consciousness. There is no visible image of existence as, except for existence, something that exists. 
So the fact that we exist and have a consciousness, we would be in the likeness of the creator, which would be consciousness, existence. So basically, as I said before, you had consciousness and existence create a physical form, which would be not just us, everything that we see out in the universe. So let us make man in our image after our likeness. The image and likeness of the creator would be what? You know, what we are. You know, we we are that. We are the result of consciousness creating energy, creating the elements, creating matter. That's what we are. So when you go, again, when you go to the creation of Adam, talking about the atoms, those are the elements. Creating man from the dust of the ground. The ground, the earth, stardust. That's all it is. That's what we are. We are stardust. We are made up of stardust. It's just that simple. Everything started with stardust. <laughs> Big chunks dust, from dust to clumps to big boulders to what have you. You go from planets, you go from grass and everything, what have you, to us. These are all elements and energy and all this stuff coming from one conscious source. It's not no being that created this body. Again, this body was created. And then when you go back to the story in Genesis, it's telling you that. Remember, let us form man. Make man, I'm going to mold this man like canoe, molding man on a potter's wheel. God didn't create this spirit, this energy, this soul. They create that. So when Satan goes to the garden and he says to Eve, hey, bullshit, you ain't going to die if you eat off this tree. He know you ain't going to die because he understood that they were gods lacking knowledge. You, you are God. You just like this dude. You just don't have the knowledge. You don't have the understanding of knowing what you are. Know thyself, you know, going back to Egyptian parable. You just don't know who you is. Why does Satan know? Because he went through the same shit. If you, when you get into the whole parable of the story, God created him. Why don't you just kill Satan off him? Get rid of him. You can't because he's just like you. He is you. So understand what it's trying to say here is the creator, whoever it is, is just like us. Made from what? Stardust. It's not the hundred the real you know supreme consciousness of the universe it's just whatever these beings are that created us they are made from the same thing as we are they have more knowledge than we do they have a different composition than we do they have more knowledge they can do more things they are you know well well more experienced in this universe than us but they are not the creator of the entire universe. So when you're tracing all this back to the powers that be, when you're tracing all this back to Ezekiel, when you're tracing this back to, you know, what we talked about as far as these people proclaiming themselves to be God, it's basically telling you exactly the same thing, that these people are proclaiming to be God, claiming to have all this power. They may know more than you do, but in, you know, in essence, for real, for real, they just like you. They are not all powerful beings. They are not the gods, the creators. And may seem that way because they trick you to believe they are. So now remember, we talked about the purple dot. We talked about the purple dot of the Marex. And uh, the purple dot that basically gives uh, Phoenician its names. Uh, its name from the uh, Greeks who called it Phoenician. From the Greek word uh, Phoenicus. And that purple dot. Now, purple dye, again, everything that we've been seeing so far, you can go in the Bible and you can find purple dye as well. So when you look in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 27, 7 says, Fine linen, where boarded work from Egypt, was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy sail. Blue and purple from the isles of Elisha was that which covered thee. So this is Elisha. Elisha is basically in ancient Ionia. Now, Elisha is a man. Elisha is the son of Jovan. Jovan goes back to Japheth. Japheth, remember, goes back to Greek mythology to Iapetus, who was a titan. Remember, Iapetus is one of the moons of Saturn. It's the moon that looks like the Death Star. So you have all of this Greek mythology, everything pointing you into the direction of the Greeks, one, but also in the direction of Satan. Saturn, Satan. They're giving you everything right here all in 
Ezekiel. Ezekiel is really important to understand when you start going through the verses and seeing what all this stuff pertains to. We only scrape the surface. We only gonna be able to scrape the surface in this video. It's so much more, but we will eventually get into all of it as we go along. But it's giving you so much, you know. So we understand one. What is the purple dye about? We understand this goes back to the colors of royalty. The purple, the purple and scarlet. We know about that. So the purple goes back to royalty. There was never a king of Tyre. The Egyptians didn't do that whole king thing. The only person who would even be crowned king in Tyre would be Alexander. He's the only one that will be crowned king. So they're giving you the clues here. What did they do? We, we, we're talking about one, this is the birthplace of Europe. The Europeans are the one who started this whole king shit. Kings, kings, kings. They talk about kings, one, you know, everybody was kings, this and that. And the thing is, the timeline is out of whack. Because you would think all these territories that existed during the time of Kemet, around the time a lot of these people was king. They had no concept of it. It was just about conquest, conquest. The whole king things was them understanding how a structure, a governmental structure was set up. We had that in Africa, not just in Kemet. So they got it from us. But this is how they began their kingship. The European powers. Purple was their color. We understand about purple and scarlet. You know, in the Bible, we know the Vatican. That's their colors. They wear purple and scarlet. So they're trying to basically mark, as I said before, the beginning of their reign. So you had the siege of Tyre and the siege of Israel, which is one of the reasons why Israel is the Holy Land, because you have all you have the religions come together there, which are the religions that's leading everything right now. But you got to understand, look it up, 332 BC, 332 BC, they actually conquered Israel and Tyre at the same time, the same time. These are the Holy Lands to them. This is the places they still rule to this day that they cloak. It's all still ruled by Rome. Rome never lost power. Whatever they tell you is bullshit. They are still in power and have been still in power. Again, the papacy. I mean, they point you right in, into their direction. Again, we know purple and scarlet. We know Revelation is talking about the, the uh, woman dressed in purple and scarlet. You know, when she had uh, jewels and everything in her body, just comparing her to the same thing they said to Satan. This is why the Geneva Bible called the Pope the Antichrist. Adorned in jewels and you know pearls and everything, just like they describe Satan. They describe the whore of Babylon or the so-called, you know, scarlet witch and everything you want to call her. Same shit. Pointing you right in that direction, giving you everything right in Ezekiel. You just gotta look. When you start reading, there's no way you can get around it. Everything we've been talking about is going back to Europe, is pertaining to the powers that be, pertaining to the European powers, and they rise. They lay siege to Israel. They, they lay siege to Tyre. They had to get into these lands first in order to, you know, really begin a conquest. And this was what really started it for them. And it's pointing you right in this direction and giving you everything. So now remember, Nebuchadnezzar, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. Remember, it's giving you his dream. Remember, Daniel was supposed to interpret his dream. He had these dreams and he tried to get the magicians and everybody to come and interpret it. They couldn't do it. So he was like killing them off or what have you. And then, you know, he was like, Daniel, you're supposed to have favor with God or what have you. You come in and interpret these dreams for me. And he came and he basically, you know, told him about the dreams. Remember the dreams. Think about it. Somebody had just exploded right now. <laughs> what were the dreams about? The four nations, the four nations. Remember, gold, and iron, I mean, the brass and the iron or what have you, dirt. What, what, what were those four nations? Here they go. Here they go. Now, Babylon, we can skip Babylon. Babylon, what should be there should be Egypt. But this is how they try to hide and distort it, put Babylon there. But you have Babylon, which should be Egypt. You have Persia. You have the Greeks, you have the Romans, you have the Romans again. What is we talking about here? Remember, we go back to Ezekiel 26, 7, I believe it was, when he basically said, I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar to lay siege to where? Tyre. Didn't he send Nebuchadnezzar? Look at what Nebuchadnezzar is. You understand what I'm saying? You get it now. 
So those, when you look at the bust, notice how it's in the shape of a man, but that man is supposed to be Nebuchadnezzar. And you have the colors, the, the stones, whatever, the gold or what have you. But you have this man representing the, ex, the exact, the, the nations that actually went in there and basically laid siege to Tyre. So when he said in Ezekiel that I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar, he really did send Nebuchadnezzar. This is the hint it's giving again. It's one of those daggers, you know, to the Bible when not only do they hide the see how they hit it really well. They hit it really good. Not only do they give you the story, but you have to look deeper. And this is what we're going to go through as we go, you know, into Bible more and more. So when you look deeper, the answer is right there. They give it to you. This is why I say to people it's in codes. It's hidden. It's in riddles. You got to know where to look. If you read the book and you know history, you're going to be able to figure this stuff out. So again, we start to look. There's absolutely no proof of Israelites. There's no proof of Hebrews existing before the third century BCE, the fourth century BCE. They don't exist. There are people who are hearing these stories. When you go through the researches, all of a sudden out of nowhere, you start hearing about these Hebrews. And then you find the people calling themselves Hebrews. This is why the black Hebrews are saying, well, wait a minute, we were black first. And that's true, but it's not true in the sense that these people really existed. They were made this way. So when you had the Greeks conquer the land we know as Israel, it was already Africans there. Egyptians was there. Black people was there. So they were forced upon, this teaching was forced upon them. And this whole understanding of them being these Hebrew, these people, was forced upon them. And there were people who were going out to try to ascertain the validity of the claims of these people, and they couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. So as I talk about this, you have Hecateus. Now, Hecateus was one of those people who was a Greek historian who was going out and supposedly trying to figure out the validity of the Jews. And he's a historian. So he supposedly mapped the world and went and did all this. So they've gone to Hecateus to find out, hey, did these people exist? And Hecateus tells it straight up, he heard that they existed from the Egyptians, but he's never met a Jew. So you have to think about that. These people are who the Bible claims they are. Somebody would have heard a historian that's going out and basically supposedly traveling the world and doing you know research will have heard of Jews if they did everything that the Bible claims that they did. But Hecateus, you know, who was basically um, he lived during the time uh the Egyptians were in power. He lived through that. He he's seen. He's seen what was going on. And you have a drop off, you know, him, Herodotus, and then there's a drop off because of war. And then you have Diodorus Siculus, who basically picks up later on. Um, and is he has one of the largest libraries. Everybody knows he has like the largest library of old books, manuscripts. And he is the one who is quoting Hecateus. And one of the things I'm, I'm going to show you in the video coming up that everything that we know about Hebrews, everything we know about the Israelites, is coming from the Adorisiculus, basically via his notes that he has from Hecateus, who is basically considered the number one authority on the Jews back then and their validity. Nobody else. So everybody talking about Josephus, they're... Josephus and everybody else, every other historian is referring to the writings of Diodorus Siculus and what he got from Hecateus. This, this, that's it. It's the end of it. End of story. Nobody else has anything. Nobody else has any more information than this. Anybody who does real research understand this, that everybody is copying from this information. So now, if you do real research, everybody who has went on to study this whole thing and getting into the whole thing with the creation of the Bible. Now, if you're arguing, arguing biblical doctrine or biblical religion, especially with Hebrew Israelites, this is what you're getting into when you get into the scholarship of it. So for those of you who have looked, what did you find? You find, because you're trying to prove the authenticity of the Bible, which we cannot because we're never going to have the originals or be able to prove that they even existed. So what we can prove is one, if we can find proof that the Jews actually existed during a certain time prior, let's just say, 4th century BCE, 
that they had a legacy and people talked about them, it gives more validity to the Bible itself. So what you had when you start to look, what did you find? You find a bunch of scholars who were trying to prove the existence of Jews. They were trying to look for the Jews. And this is prior to the whole conquering of Kemet. So understand, as I tell the Hebrews, when Kemet fell, part of the Egyptian empire was Israel. It stretched all the way over to Israel. So they came into Israel, they conquered Israel, which was full of African people, Egyptians, black people. I talked about Tunis, I talked about, you know, uh, Tyre or Tyrus. We know it was Africans there, all this was conquered, right? So when they conquered these lands and they started to implement Hellenization, which Hellenization is basically the spreading of this, what we call the Jewish doctrine. So they took these Africans and made them Jews, Hebrews. They bred them to, well, they didn't breed them, but basically raised them, put them in school to learn this and say to them, this is who you are. You are these people. And they made priests and, and taught them to go out and spread the word, just like we see with the Bible Christianity with the slaves. You had that one black guy that was up there preaching to the slaves. It's the same thing back then. That's where the whole concept came from. So when you look, you find these philosophers and researchers, Greeks, trying to prove this existence, right? So that's what you find. 